Is it good enough to outperform its competition at price point? And that is what we're going to find out today. This looks great on a brand new car, but I really can't help but wonder how it's going to age. A few stone chips on here, a bit of scratching. I just don't know it's going to look all that great. But meanwhile, it does present a big solid front. Electric cars are very challenging from a design standpoint because of that skateboard of batteries you have to fit into the bottom. That leads to bulbous front ends and back ends. And of course, you have the added challenge that aerodynamics on electric vehicles really, really matter. And this, the way the daytime running light is cut straight into the front, shows you that they're not just haphazardly throwing these things together. There is still a lot of thought in giving this a heritage feeling within the brand. Let's have a look and see what's going on under the hood. Well, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that Nissan are innovators in this area. So when they come out and say, listen, we don't think you need a frunk, I think it's worth listening. It's not just a cost saving exercise. In fairness, the only reason that frunks are so essential on some electric vehicles is because there's so little space available in the back. Here, I really don't think there's a significant need for one, but more than that is the reason why this is laid out the way that it is. All of the heating and cooling stuff is utilized in this space, and it means that this car manages to deliver an even 50-50 weight distribution, which is significant in terms of its handling and performance. So even if you go with the system that isn't all-wheel drive, you can still get 48-52 on that weight split, and that should make all the difference in the world to the way in which it handles. So, is a frunk essential? What do you think? 4 meters 60 or 181 inches. It's round at the side where the Aria for me really becomes a Nissan and definitely demonstrates its compact SUV credentials. Now, Again, whether you like or don't like the styling, what I do like with Nissan is at least it's brand consistent. That said, it's interesting for me the distinction between this and the X-Trail. It seems to me that their pure electric line really does have a bit of a mind of its own. Here, the visual presence is once again all about that floor of batteries. Now, this has the larger battery array. That's 87 kilowatt hours net. That only takes up a little bit of extra space out of the boot but clearly you can't see that from the side. What you can see from the side are these wheels. Now they're available in either 19 or 20 inch. Here you can see they're displayed as 20 inch. Stylistically, that looks big and bold and fits with the car, but is it gonna mean any compromise in terms of ride comfort? Well, we'll be finding out a little bit later on. Round at the back and you really can see that the guy who got the discount on the lacquer black paint went all out in order to make the car look a bit more sporty and not compromise on boot space. That's what happens right here. They have to push out the rear as far as they can possibly get it to give you the maximum amount of load space possible. But we still have to satisfy the criteria of aerodynamics. And because of that, you have a very compressed lower section that's going to lead itself to a window box like view out of the rear. And it does mean that visually, well, the styling's a little compromised. They've tried to address that with this aerofoil back here to bring more visual attention higher up the car, but there's nothing in the world you can do about this. This is a very big bulbous rear. Once you gain entry into the car using it, well, the first thing that strikes you is the quality of the finish here. The way that the interior has been finished, and that's always started off at the door, feels discreet, low key, and high quality. A good mix of materials, nothing here that's gonna blow your mind or change your world, but it's all nicely executed and delivered. If only they'd resisted the urge to use yet more of that shiny black finish. If I was gonna buy one of these cars, I would absolutely look first to the Alcantara finish. I think that's a nicer experience. But look at the detailing. I will say that visually these seats are very nicely finished off indeed. Believe it or not, this is actually as low as the seat can go. So even though you might be thinking, surely this guy can't be five foot 10, I do have a very long torso. So you can compare me at sitting to around about 6162. I'm not really loving this just in a sitting in the vehicle point of view. I feel like I should have a lot more headspace than I actually do. As far as the seat itself is concerned, it's really small. I'm not a massive guy, but I don't feel like I have an awful lot of support here anywhere. As you can see, there is a little bit in the way of bolster support, but the seat is very narrow indeed, 
which means that it doesn't actually make me feel as if I'm terribly well centered in the car at all. Now, I think part of that might be because of the choice of material. If I was a bit more bedded into a material seat, I think I wouldn't notice that slipping around quite so much. Nissan have done a great job with the wheel itself. It feels just right for the car, just the right size and just the right diameter. So it really feels like it belongs to this car and is solid and secure. That is as low as it's gonna go. Won't go any lower at all. I'm not quite sure why that is, but it does slightly limit your possibility of adjusting the wheel. I mean, it's, it's okay, but the first thing that you notice, especially if you have a longer torso or you're a taller person like me, is that once you put this wheel into a position where it's right for driving, well, can you see my sight line through here straight to the cockpit? I'm immediately not getting the information that I want directly off the driver's display. Now that's not the end of the world in this car because it does have a head up display and I'm really keen to see how well that's delivered once we start driving. What I will say is that the material mix in this car is very nice indeed. If you have a look just to the side of the steering wheel, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Alcantara here and just some nice styling details by way of these air vents. The driver is greeted by two 12.3 inch screens and as you can see, there's a really lovely curve right in the middle that lifts up the infotainment system. Some of this design work looks more than a little bit dated. It's okay. It just doesn't feel nearly as modern and fresh as the rest of the car. And because you're going to want to be interacting with this, it just should be a bit more representative of exactly how the system operates overall. It's okay. It's just not great. I suspect most people are gonna plug their phones straight into this system and just live with Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. I mean, a moving center console, I can definitely see the utility in that. And I like the greater flexibility that it offers you in terms of storage. Now, I don't know about you, I've got three kids at home and I can tell you that while I'm in a shop that they're not gonna join me in because they'd rather sit in the car this is what they're going to be doing <laughs> endlessly. Well, I did say that I like the added utility of having a movable center console that gives you access to this space below. You can put an extra mobile phone down here. As you can see, there's USB-C and standard USB-A charging and even a nice little bit of cable management. And look at this, a 12 volt charge point. Now, none of that looks particularly nice, so I do like the fact that I can make it all magically disappear as I bring my center console forwards. And speaking of center console, things I like, this material finish is excellent and it goes really well with this material that matches the rest of the inside of the car. The adaptive drinks holders, well, they usually feel pretty cheap and plasticky in most cars and I do appreciate the fact that I can hide them out of the way when I don't need them. As you'll already have gathered, I passionately hate capacitive buttons, especially ones that I essentially need to use. Note here the e-pedal button and the drive mode selector. Yes, it looks good, but I don't need it to look good. I need it to be quick and easy to access while I'm driving. First thing to notice, well done Nissan, a really great wide approach angle on this rear door. I'm always very excited when manufacturers do that because obviously lots of people face different physical challenges and it makes it much easier for those people, dare I say, older people to get in and out of the car. So that's really nice. Well, first things first, my goodness, the same stiffness in the seats as you get at the front, possibly even a little more so. So if you didn't like it up front, you're definitely not going to like it back here. And the material has the same slide equality and same lack of any kind of uh, dip into which you sit. Well, there's a good reason why that's an advantage. And that's because, unlike many other cars, the middle is actually functionally useful on here. Bizarrely, I don't think that the headspace back here is any less good than the headspace up front. So actually, you know what? You really can fit five people in this car. This central tunnel is in its forward position. And again, this is what really helps us to fit five people back here. With it right the way back, the car is much better configured for four passengers but I like the way that the passengers back here have been thought of. It's nice to have different charging solutions and of course the luxury of heated rear seats as well. Once you get into the boot of the Aria, you actually get quite a pleasant surprise. 
what you're looking at is 415 litres of load space. And that's because this has the bigger of the two available batteries. If you go with the smaller battery, front wheel drive only, then you get up to 470 litres. And the space is really well utilised here. So this opening that you can see right here is one metre in diameter. That's around about three foot and four inches. And the available depth is just a little bit short of that. So again, one meter or about three feet and four inches. The height is about 65 centimeters, so about two feet, just over two feet. So you've got a very decently proportioned boot and Nissan have utilized the space really well. Here we have cable storage and of course, part of the stereo keeping you company back here. Slightly further up, another storage area for tools. The rear seats, of course, fold flat in a 60-40 configuration, but interestingly, that is something that you can only do from inside the car. But when you have, they almost fold more or less flat, and as you can see, you have ample storage space throughout this vehicle, even with the larger battery stored below. The car we're driving is the Aria E-Force Evolve. That's the top model. It's got the 87 kilowatt battery, the big one, and all wheel drive. If you haven't seen Thomas's clip, he took out the front wheel drive, smaller battery version. So this then should be the biggest, best, and most impressive of everything that the Aria has to offer. First thing we need to talk about is the driving position and comfort. I'm five foot 10 or 178 centimeters but I do have an especially long torso and short legs. That means I'm always towards the front of the vehicle. And in this car, that represents a little bit of a challenge. Now, we all know that if you have a panoramic roof, that's gonna cost you at least an inch off the height of the vehicle. In a modern car, that generally isn't a significant problem. But in this car, I have to tell you, this seat is set as low as it goes. And as you can see, if it weren't for the fact that the roof liner was pulled back, then my head would be slightly squashed against the roof. Obviously, I like to sit facing forwards for driving. Facing forwards, you know what I mean. But there is no way that I can get comfortable in this car without the fact that my head is buffeting up against the roof. Because of that long torso, you can compare me at around about six foot one to two. Long story short, if you're a tall guy, I just don't know that you're gonna manage to feel that comfortable in this car. As I said, I can't make the seat any lower, so it really is a bit of a problem, and I'm surprised that they've designed it that way. Now that brings me very nicely onto the seats. Bit of a hit and miss affair here, if I'm completely honest. They have a very firm feeling to them, which is not usually a bad thing. Obviously, that's better for dynamic driving, but what's curious here is the mix of that firm seat with literally no side support at all. So, it's a slightly odd sensation. I think the lower down spec with the Alcantara seat is going to be a much nicer seating experience and possibly will also give you a little bit more cushioning. My very first impression of driving this car is that the steering feels a little on the light side, but where the car comes into its own is the way in which it delivers the feedback from the drive and that lower center of gravity because of the batteries. You get a really nice balance between a light responsive steering, but you still feel that you're getting an awful lot of information off the road, which given the 20 inch wheels is maybe a little bit more information at times with these very direct seats than you might love. It's inarguably not the most comfortable car that you can drive, but it does make you feel an awful lot more connected with the driving experience than other electric cars that I've driven. So, I really like the steering and I like the way that the feedback is delivered. On top of that, you have to remember that this car does not have adaptive suspension. It does, however, have McPherson strut in the front and multi-link in the back, and that multi-link really does make a difference to how this car handles and how it behaves. Clearly, with those batteries and two electric motors on board, you have a lot of additional weight you don't feel that and it doesn't upset you while you're driving. Great, again, two thumbs up. Yes, the all-round visibility isn't stunning here. As I look through the back, it very definitely feels like a letterbox, but they have taken care of that by giving you the option of a fully digital 
rear display. Now here I'm just gonna show my age. I just don't get on well with these things. I'll take a letterbox any day of the week over a digital rear display, but I really do like the fact that it's available as an option, and I think that has a lot more to do with my age and profile than anything to do with a problem with the technology. Although screens are still coming on a lot and they could still be an awful lot better. One of the things you might well ask yourself at this point is do I really need to go with that extra power to get that faster acceleration? Interestingly enough, although I would always say you don't really need it, if you do live in an area with limited overtaking opportunities, it does without question make a significant difference. One of the things I really like about this car is the way in which it delivers the power. And I don't just mean the acceleration. Let me show you what I mean. If I slow this down. And now I'm not gonna give it full beans, just a nice lift off. It's a really elegant way of giving you those available 300 Newton meters of torque, which it has front and back in a way that tells you I've got what you need, but I'm not going to scare you with it. Would you, is that a fair assessment, Thomas? Would you agree with that description? Yeah. It's just really well delivered and everything works nicely together. The acceleration, the handling, again, really great feedback through the steering system. The suspension, although, you know, some people might say, yeah, but it's pretty basic. Actually, it all works together really nicely. Look at this, I'm just gonna play a little bit. Let's have a bit of speed into these lovely winding roads here. Fantastic. I really can get a very good responsive drive out of this car. I'm gonna slow down. I really don't want to mess with the French speeding rules too much at all. And let's let this guy go past. There we go. So, <laughs> I think I was driving at least 60 kilometers an hour slower than that guy wanted to go. You do tend to find an awful lot of driving like that around the Pyrenees, but these are lovely roads and you can understand why. Where the car itself is concerned, the overall experience is excellent. Really very good indeed. The drive is fantastic. Now, as I said, the handling is a little bit light for me, but don't worry, we have driving modes. I'm sure you can appreciate without that adaptive suspension, the only thing that's changing is the steering and the acceleration. And here again, this is where I'm not in love with these capacitive buttons. Changing the driving mode in this car is going to involve me needing to take my eyes off the road, and I just don't enjoy doing that. But there we go, let's cycle through. So I'm gonna put the car now into sport. And it wasn't a pleasant experience to do that. I didn't like the experience. What you immediately find though is that that lightness has gone from the steering. It now feels much more heavy, much more connected to the car. And even around this village, the accelerator feels a lot more precise. So an electronically delivered driving mode selector, which I think you're really going to enjoy. Clearly we're gonna to have to wait for a little bit to get outside of town to see what that does to the drive, but I'm actually looking forward to it. Okay, so interesting. The sports mode is definitely different in terms of how it handles and feels. I have to say, I think I agree with Thomas. We're on some nice windy roads here, so that will deliver the most agility that the car has to offer. I think I prefer the standard driving mode. Although this steering is now heavier, which you could argue corrects one of the things that I didn't love about it, the lightness of the steering, it doesn't feel like a good representation of the car. Clearly this isn't a sports car. I don't think this adds anything to the experience at all. And although it's nice to have that increased effect with the acceleration, you can achieve that in the standard driving mode anyway, just by using a little bit more weight on your foot. So, I don't think sports gives you anything you particularly need. Let's slot this back down again into normal. And again, I really hate changing these modes. It doesn't feel natural or good. You also may just about have been able to pick up on the microphone, the change in sound in terms of how that acceleration is delivered. For me, this car was refined and perfected in its drive in standard mode. I see no reason to ever leave it 
for performance. Yes, the steering's a little light, but it accurately reflects the car and the drive is great. And that power's all there when I want it. I just put my foot down. There's the e-pedal. It's actually a lot more refined than the last time I drove this tech in Nissan. So I'd be really interested to see if they've rebalanced this just for this car. That's a lot smoother. What we'll have to see, if I can do this without irritating the guy behind me, is what happens when I really get this slowed down. That's been a problem previously. Once you hit the bottom end, no, it's much better. That's pretty good. How's that as a passenger, Thomas? Seems to be good. It feels a little too urgent. How's that for comfort? Again, if the seats were more comfortable, you wouldn't notice that so much. Yeah. I think that's pretty nice though, no? It is, yeah. It seems to be. Ah, oh, thank you, Nissan. That's great. So I actually think they have tweaked this for this car because it feels to me like a much softer delivery. And that's really good news because I would like to be doing more one pedal driving, provided I can do so without the discomfort of my passenger. I think that's key for me. That's my distinction. If I can drive around town with one pedal driving and feel that my passenger is getting the same degree of comfort of drive as they would have in standard driving, then I'm happy. And I have to say, this is actually really good. Charge point for the car is at the front and on the side. And here we have some really nice features. This is AC charging and it's actually three phase. So 22 kilowatts is what you can charge the car at through there. Down below you've got DC charging and that delivers 130 kilowatts of charge. That's going to allow you to take your car from 10 to 80% in around about 35 minutes. We ended up amazingly with a kilowatt hour number of 17 per 100 kilometers driven, which amounts to 27 for every 100 miles. That's an average speed that we drove at 50 kilometers per hour, but that gives you an effective range for this vehicle of about 370 kilometers, which is 230 miles. If you've got the smaller or 63 kilowatt hour battery, this is the larger, the 87 kilowatt hour battery. That gives you an effective range of 512 kilometers, which is 320 miles. We've driven in temperatures as low as minus four today, and we've driven up and down mountains. So I have to say, achieving an average of between 17 and 18 is a fantastically good result and really puts this car in a very good position indeed.